So who's heard of Grok? You guys don't count. <laughs> right. Good. So that's why I'm here today, is just to talk a little bit about Grok and how we have a perspective about Converged. I think we talked earlier about how compute, that there's a traditional compute side of things, and then you know, we've run up to a wall on that, right? You just can't keep adding hardware and, you know, spending power, but it's important in how do you apply machine learning to that and take it to the next step. So that's kind of kind of be the presentation today. Um, and it will apply. I know there was a, a comment that this could have been finance. It does apply to finance too, and I'll comment on that a little bit on finance. But I'm going to kind of show the perspective around the entire markets and different types of applications today. So let me, let me just introduce Grok, since not everyone raises their hands. Um, we're located in the Bay Area. Um, we're a six-year-old company. Um, our focus is really around machine learning and accelerating that for real-time applications, especially around uh, inference. Um, we can actually infer HPC, and that's where you have the conversion of those two together. We're about 200 employees uh, worldwide, so we're not in a specific area, so we're de demographically around the world, especially our engineering teams. And it really starts off with our chip, the Grok chip. So we are a semiconductor company at heart, and we've developed this chip called the Grok chip, which is a tensor processing uh, core. It's a single core. It allows you to program the chip easily, and I'll talk about that programming flow later. But it's important to understand that this chip is different than a traditional compute chip like a GPU. A GPU has multi-cores. This is a single chip streaming processor. Right. And so it allows you to stream things realistically in a real time, determinism, and scale. So I can take this chip and put a bunch of them together and we have this large compute capability around machine learning. So that is the core of what we offer at Grok. We deploy that in different form factors. One is the PCIe card right, plug into servers, right, that will give you the performance of about 188 petaflops of performance just on a single card with a single chip on there. And then for larger scale, we offer something we call the Grok node. The Grok node has eight of those cards in there that allows you to actually increase the performance even more significantly, offering 1.5 teraflops per second, so high performance. And then if you really need to take it to the next level of scale, it's really important to understand we offer a Grok Rack, which has eight of these nodes in there, and that gives you a 12 petaflops of performance. So that's really significant there. So we're solving real time, real problems today with accelerating AI. And that's where the AI is take needed to enhance that performance versus the traditional compute. But it really starts from the software. So we're, we, we at heart are a software first company, right? I can build the silicon, but the silicon itself will be useless without having software that can actually program this chip. So we architected our software first as part of the architecture. Once we architected that software, we built that Grok chip. So there are compatibility and ease of use of that. And we try to make it simple for developer velocity. Out of the box, right? You can download the software today. We're one of the only AI companies outside of the GPU guys who you can actually get the software today and use it today and drive your PyTorch, your TensorFlow models through Onyx Graph, which allows you to map that into the chip and easily get the results that you're looking for much more quicker. And for those who need fine-grained control for performance, you're able to use our Grok API tool that basically does bare metal uh, configuration of the chip. So you can eke out all that performance or those unique performances needs where you're looking for. Another important area too is that we're libraryless and kernelless. Right? You don't need to kind of structure your code to a library. You don't need that. It's just seamlessly driven there. And then you can profile your uh, code as you program in there with our profiler. And then we have a tool chain that's very simple to use. It's called Grokflow. One line of code, PyTorch or TensorFlow, and can I can easily get the results that I want with using this tool. So very significant capability that we offer today. And here's the proof, right? We took models out of public domains, like Hugging Face, and we compiled these quickly. So we're able to compile, a couple of months ago, about 400 plus different types of codes. Everything from natural language processing, computer vision, neural, any kind of neural network today. So for you as a user, you're easily able to drive these models quickly through the compiler and get what you want. So these, this number is actually much higher than before. 
And so we're driving a big significant part of there. So again, ease of use, right, using machine learning. And that comes back to the traditional, where I traditionally have done it with compute, like CPUs. Now I'm able to add this on top of that traditional compute that I've, I've done previously. So let's talk about what Converge is. So there was a traditional way of doing things, right? But we hit a wall, Moore's Law. Again, as I mentioned, you can't hit the compute exactly. You have CPUs. It's challenging. I just can't add hardware to that. So the industry is trying to do is add ML on top of that, okay? I have a big, large piece of data set. I take that data set. I want to train it. I'll drive it. I got my model. I'll basically now want to inference that to improve my capabilities above the traditional compute. So if I take AI or an ML model, right, which I want to take and that would inference the variances of that data from the traditional compute, then I add, for example, graph analytics, which basically connects that data stream to make sure I get the results I'm looking for. And then I add on top of that uh, traditional compute like high-performance computing, HPC, which I'm just trying to solve a single problem. That really takes us to this data model converge. So I'm taking the best of these different three things and driving that convergence model across that. That gives me better compute, better efficiency around what I want to do. And also, at the end of the day, it gives me the ability to do things in real time. Okay? So that's really where the trend is going, is people are pushing things on the real time side of things. So why do we think, Grok, this is important? Right? Um, decades ago, we had scarcity of data. Right? Nowadays, we have so much data. We just cannot process this data. Right? How do we drive that? And that's really driven, making a lot of challenges. ML models are growing in size, compute is required, right? Training these models are very, very expensive these days. So the idea here is to understand how can I get more faster in doing things, more accuracy around things, and really driving instead of an offline AI capability, real-time AI capability to save on the bottom line. Okay. So that takes us to the data model convergence, which is really putting those things together. And I've listed here a list of different types of applications that people can leverage this. And I'll give you some examples very quickly, and then later I'll go into a lot of more details on some examples to just prove out this convergence capability that we have today. U.S. government, you know, they're trying to do real-time CV, computer vision, right? That comes critical. They traditionally did that with traditional compute. Now they're adding ML on top of that for computer vision, right? Cybersecurity. The key here is finding those anomalies and the false positives, reducing that, right? Compute does it, but it's not as efficient, but you can add ML on top of that and reduce that, and I'll show some examples there. Research and science, I think everyone knows the biggest problem we have today is weather prediction, real-time weather prediction, right? Do I take my umbrella, not take my umbrella, right? Is a hurricane going to hit the south of Florida or the north of Florida? These are the challenges we're going to have. And to be able to predict that and add the traditional compute with ML together would definitely give me that better accuracy. Yeah. And then finance, you know, for those who came here for finance, right? Finance is critical, right? We've achieved the compute capabilities of China, China, finance that we can do. Now we're looking at adding ML to that. So pricing predictions. I buy an asset. Can I predict where that price will eventually go or where it will end up, right? And so people are applying ML across the board on that. Industrial is another area of importance, right? You know, um, any industrial system that is down costs money. I can't ship products. So an area of turbine prediction, right? Looking at the waveforms of turbines coming out and assessing that through machine learning to assess if those waveforms have fluctuating there can predict that that turbine will actually start to fail. So I can prevent that from happening in making sure that I meet my expectations. And finally, enterprise comms. We all use WebEx and uh, Google Meets and Zoom, right? Speech to text is very critical, real-time speech to text, translations. Those are things where you take the traditional compute, you add ML on top of that, I'm able to provide that capability. So let's look at this from, uh, from the landscape. There's two parts of it. There's the accuracy aspects of this, which is basically trying to make sure that I can get the results and the quality I'm looking for. And there's just pure throughput, compute just throwing compute at it, right? Traditional compute, like HPC, will give you that accuracy. I mean, machine learning will probably struggle with that for now because of the requirements there. But with performance, what ML gives you, it gives you that performance and throughput across the board. 
But traditional compute is just ha hampered with that right now. It's very difficult to just, again, as I mentioned, to increase the hardware requirements that you're looking for. So the whole idea is to get to that orange thing and higher is better. All right. And so we want to get these things to converge so I can get both the best worlds, the accuracy, and I can get the throughput that's required. So this is really critical in what we want to see today. All right. So I'm going to show an example of this, right? Um, and it's, uh, it's working, so that's good. So you see the flow there. <laughs> that's great. So this is computation of fluid dynamics using a host of different applications. Aerospace, automotive, you know, just name it. You know, this is a really big area. So I'll try to describe what's going on here. So on the top left, you have the traditional HPC. Okay? This is taking a, 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 an image okay, at a fine grain capability and, manage, and, and driving that. But you can see the performance, you know, thousands of seconds. It takes too long, right? And then this is very a simple example. Think about a real-world example where it would take days and months, could be, to just comp compute this. But then on the right side, on the top here, if I had to kind of reduce the image, more coarse, I'd get better performance, but the accuracy, right, see it's blurry? Right? So you, you'll see that I don't get the accuracy that I'm looking for, okay? But if I drive just ML by itself, right, I'll get some performance and everything, but when I converge the two together, I get the best option here because it's much clearer, better throughput across the board through this capability today. Right. And so this is just gives you an example of the data when you drive it through both converged, traditional, and ML that you get the best results from this. Another area too is cybersecurity. We're all worried about cybersecurity attacks on our networks. Uh, in finance, you worry about transactions. You want to monitor the transactions. You worry about money laundering. And so the idea here is I have ways of doing this, IDS, intrusion detection systems, protection systems, right? This is how I do traditionally, I'd run uh, my cybersecurity. The problem with that is uh, detecting these anomalies, right? And also the false positives, right? False positives usually in double digits, 40, 30% to get a false positive, right? You don't want to use your credit card and the credit card company doesn't understand why you're charging in New York and it declines it, and you're upset. That's what they're more worried about, is the customer service aspects of things. So if I combine both the traditional way of doing it, which gives me 100,000, 100, 120,000 uh, inspections per second, or inferences per second, and add capabilities on ML, I get 1,000x better in performance. So I get that throughput, I get that accuracy that I'm needed here. So it gives you that real-time capability that you're looking for. And this is something, if, you know, if you're really interested in this, we have a partner, we have, it's called Entanglement. Um, they've, we work with them, they've uh, uh, promoted this, and there's public reports on how the traditional compute with the addition of ML, what the Army put a report out, can actually describe that today. And you can find it online, or you can come to our booth and we can talk more about that. The other area is smart grids. Um, one of the three major issues is cybersecurity. Right, um, issues with public safety, right? These are things that they have to monitor at the end node. So there's a traditional compute, and then you add the framework of machine learning on top of that, and you're able to really monitor the concerns or the challenges that you see with that. So you can get a magnitudes of order of improvements over this with smart grids. And one example of this is um, something that Grok worked with one of the national labs, Argonne, where we basically uh, looked at a uh, fusion reactor, right? This is the future. The problem with fusion reactors, they're insta instable, right? But they're very efficient, right? So how do I manage that, you know, the uh, instability of that thing through the controller, right? So I use the traditional compute, but it's not working. But if I add inference to it, I get a 600x improvements over what I've done. So this gives the stability in, in understanding if there's some sort of anomaly going to occur in the fusion reactor, I can detect it and adjust for it. Right. And the future is to get better energy, more efficient things that are more safer like fusion reactors. So this does give us the huge advantage of putting these two together, the traditional and the, uh, the ML. So what does that mean, right? There's, there's components to success here. Um, number one is, you know, 
developers, right? I want to make things simple, right? right? And converging those two things together, Grok has able to do that and provide that as part of the thing. So the traditional and the machine learning side of things, right? The other part is talent scarcity. People want to adapt ML, right? Finding ML developers, finding ML experts, finding solutions, CAN boxes are not very, it's very difficult these days. So having tools like our compiler and our tools that I talked about earlier in place to make the job of the developer easier and less developers to get to a solution is critical. And then latency and determinism, that's the key thing here, right? When I apply that, I want to make sure I can apply it to real-time systems that are actually providing that additional accuracy and throughput that I'm looking for as part of the solution here today. Okay, um, that's my talk. Thank you. Yeah. We are in booth 119. Yes, um, so we do have the equipment there. You can come and take a look at it. We do have some uh, material we can talk about, kind of showing you this convergence capability that we're looking at versus traditional and versus machine learning. And um, we do have a lot of examples we can actually show that today. So, okay. Thank you.